I'd just like to add one thing. He's there after two weeks, only the best day was that he misses the cut, he's too busy to cut the teacher in Hannah. Uh -huh. It's a victim from the French history, no pieces of fucking billion of authentic. Source and Cordac. Thank you so much. <laughs> the only good thing about Catholic education, my Irish mother forced down my throat as a kid was a clumpy rat so I could refute their lives. <laughs> <laughs> So much of what he said was, keep quiet about what you see, don't ask any questions. Well, there are three things the apostles specifically told the faithful church were going to happen in the last days. There are three things. Three things. Picking up where Sheldon left off, the first of those things we find in Second Timothy. Well, let's start. First Timothy, first Timothy. Chapter 4, verse 1. But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, explicitly says in the latter times, the last days, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. By means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with the branding iron. <clears throat> Serious stuff. The conscience is dysfunctional. There is no mechanism for these people to be convicted of sin. The mechanism by which the Holy Spirit were convicted of their sin is dysfunctional, is broken, is gone. They'll do things that are unspeakable, morally reprehensible, incapable of being convicted of, of, of the guilt of what they're doing. Men who forbid marriage. Sound familiar? <laughs> Abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Well, the forbidding marriage thing is obvious. That's obviously clerical celibacy. It's been around and you see the result of it. He was told to be quiet about certain things. But conscience is seared. When you've got case after case, diocese after diocese, of hierarchy protecting pedophiles <laughs> at the expense of not protecting children. Well, this pleasant hope, in the name of Christian grace, has lessened the ecclesiastical repercussions to pedophile priests because he wants to be gracious to them. What about the children? Their conscience is seared. It's an unconscionable religion. I know Catholic people who know this, they see this, and they just choose to ignore it. But then we get the second ones. Forbidding certain foods. <coughs> Have you noticed, among other things, the trends in Christian bookshops about Christian nutrition? And Christians shouldn't eat this or should eat this. Now, again, that kind of stuff, no fish, fish on Friday only, no meat on Friday. This stuff has always been around in Catholicism. It's always been around like a thousand. But it begins there. In short, hypocrites, verse 2, hypocrites and liars with seared consciences in positions of religious leadership who will defend the unconscious. So you've got unconscionable 
These are the exact words Paul uses. Liars and religious hypocrites. And you got these people as leaders. I wish that that was only the prophecy. Have you heard what Ian said about you? It's not only about that. I knew Lynn Lewis. Lynn Lewis was worse than what he told you. He didn't even tell you the half of it. Now, it's not like I'm picking on the dead when he was alive. I was straight out, eyeball to eyeball, don't worry. Have you gone to these brothers, Russell? What makes you so sure they're brothers? Yes, I went eyeball to eyeball with many hands. I may as well talk to that wall. Yes, I went eyeball to eyeball with the Archbishop of Canterbury. I may as well talk to that wall. Unconscionable. Expect it. Complete hypocrisy. Second, Foods, marriage, made the male and female, said it was good, created this for this, not for that. What does Isaiah say? Woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Expect this to happen. They will call what is good evil, and they will call what is evil good. Getting married and having a baby, you're not allowed to do that. Molesting a four-year-old will protect you. Hypocrisy? And they lied? But now let's look what Paul says. And verse 6, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished from the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. That's what's bad. But the ones who point it out will be considered in the eyes of Christ good brethren, faithful servants of Christ. Constantly nourished on the words of faith. Be careful of people who will not point these truths out. I know pastors who know these problems. We don't want to be controversial. Let's begin to understand what is going to separate the harlot church from the faithful church. The bride will be ready for, let's say, the foolish virgins from the wise ones. Understand it, whichever paradigm you wish, but it's something reiterated in scripture multiple times. Chapter 3 of the Song of Solomon, the bride is ready. Chapter 5, she isn't. The wise virgins, the foolish virgins. The harlot church, the faithful bride. Okay. But Peter tells us this is going to happen. But he also tells us that when the destruction comes, It'll be like in the days of Noah. They won't understand what's happening or why it's happening until it is too late. We again have something of a reference to this by Paul where he talks about those who love 
is appearing. Those who love is appearing, is epiphanion. We've done a new teaching recently on what is the blessed hope, and we deal extensively with the uses of scripture of the term epiphanion. Those who love is appearing. I firmly believe that my many friends, even a few people within Morial, because it's not a fundamental in our statement of faith or anything, most people in Morial would believe the rapture will not happen until the faithful church knows who the Antichrist is. But there's one or two who are pre-trip. Among ourselves, we never make this a basis of division, only of discussion. Unfortunately, there are those who do make it a basis of division. And I think wrongly. No one says it's not an important issue for discussion, but not for division. Now that's a separate subject that we're dealing with now. But what we can agree with is this. We're told the unfaithful church will not be concerned with his return. I've repeated many times that most of the lies of the devil aimed at the church in the Western world today are a avenue of seduction that is cheaply designed, is cheaply designed to get people to trust in this life. The word faith movement, the kingdom now, the name of the claimant, the dominion the, the theology. These things are largely oriented towards spiritually seducing Christians to trusting in this life, in this fallen world, instead of in the return of Jesus. Okay? Peter tells us this will reach the point of hostility. <coughs> The return of Jesus as a focus. Everything else in Scripture builds up to the book of Revelation, doesn't it? The restoration of what was lost in Genesis through sin. The culmination of God's prophetic purpose for Israel and the Jews. The original plan that God had for planet Earth being realized in the millennium and then eternity. That's the focus. Instead, the church becomes divided between those who love his appearance and those <coughs> <coughs> who really trust this world. Now understand this. When the Apostle John in his first epistle begins speaking of Antichrist, and it being the last hour and things of that nature, and we explain what all that means in other teachings, I don't want to go into things that are already explained and that are available on the internet and so forth. He prefaces it by saying, love not the world. Love not the world. There is a hand-in-hand -hand relationship between those churches and those Christians who love the world and those who are not longing for the return of Jesus. When the faithful church sees the established church placing a benediction on same-sex marriages and teaching these things to children in schools and things like this, and they realize when a society has gone this far, there's no turning back now. They long for the return of Jesus. That's not to say we should not seek to be salt and light in the meantime and oppose it, but realize what we're up against. In moments we're told that when this homosexuality thing gains momentum, the Lord's going to give them over to it. 
We're not going to stop it because God's given them overdue to judgment. We did a teaching several years ago called Not Even a Minya. And we explained this. The reason homosexuality and lesbianism become more and more militant, they don't know it, but their arrogant militancy is symptomatic of the fact that God has given them over to it. In other words, now you can't repent. <laughs> they get a spirit of error. <clears throat> Separate subject, I only mentioned it in passing. The unfaithful church will ultimately become the harlot church. Hold the form of religion, but deny the power therein. And somehow imagine that they can make their powerless church religion compatible with the world. Now, I'm not even a minion. We've explained how Lot tried to keep at peace with the homosexuals and appealed to them as brothers. But they came to a point he couldn't do it anymore. When you reach the crossroads, once again, you realize you've reached a point where you cannot do it anymore. When they demand a right to teach your children things that are fundamentally contrary to your convictions, and not only is it the state doing it at the behest of militant homosexuals and lesbians, but they're doing it with the participation of the Church of England. And other, other churches. This is, this is, they crossed the proverbial Rubicon. They've gone beyond the point of no return. The die is cast. Jakarta Aria Est. The die has been cast. That's all there is to it. One of the chief things you're going to see is this. The return of Jesus is going to become a major issue, dividing the harlot church from the faithful church. Now what will happen to these people ultimately? Look with me please to the book of Revelation. Chapter 17, verse 16. And the ten horns which you saw, and the beast, these will hate the harlot, and make her desolate and naked, will eat her flesh, and will burn her up with fire. The corrupt political establishment of the Antichrist will make use of the harlot church and of the false religious system when and up to the point it is in their political and economic interest to do so. You understand? They will play the Harlem Church as a stooge. Up to the point they don't need her anymore. They'll turn against the Harlem Church. One of the things that is going to separate the true church from the false church the return of Jesus. Some won't even believe it. Or just will think that it'll happen someday, but that doesn't concern us or something like this. They will not be concerned with prophecy and so forth. Here is a second issue. A second issue that is going to divide the true church from the harlot church. Look with me, please, to the book of Zechariah, chapter 12. I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lived it will be critically injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. <laughs> One of the things that is going to separate the faithful church from the harlot church. 
is their position on the prophetic <coughs> destiny of Israel and the Jews. Climactically, this will be some kind of a demand to compromise over the status of Jerusalem. Where Satan got his biggest defeat and where he will get his final one. That is going to be it. You've got the Presbyterian Church in Scotland, the Presbyterian Church of America, the World Council of Churches. <coughs> The Lutherans, they're all joining this boycott and this investment movement against Israel. They won't have a boycott and disinvestment movement against Saudi Arabia that will hang or decapitate somebody for being a Christian. They're queuing up to get back into Iran and do business. But Israel, you know how many Christian refugees Israel took from the Horn of Africa, from Sudan? You know when the phalangists were driven out of southern Lebanon by Hezbollah, where did they come? Not only did Israel take Jewish refugees, it took Christian refugees. Nobody persecutes Arab Christians for being Christians in Israel. The Israeli government would not allow it. But all these other countries that there is no boycott and disinvestment movement against these Arab countries or Muslim countries, not. And you're seeing these <clears throat> stinking hypocrite churches and move like the Presbyterians. The movements, the World Council of Churches, the Stephen Sizers. This is going to be a key issue that will divide the true church from the harlot church. I've been saying this for more than 20 years, and it's becoming more and more true by the month, by the week, even by the day. It's going to be a big issue. A big issue. Isaiah 11 makes it clear the Jews will be regathered twice. Jesus made it clear in Luke 21, 24. They have to be back in Jerusalem. Matthew 23, 39. They have to be back in Jerusalem and say, Baruch HaVa B'Shem and I pray him to return. Satan does not want him to return. Therefore, he does not want the Jews in Jerusalem to have a Jewish return. This is going to be something that divides the true church from the other church. Is the government of Israel without blame? No, it's like any other government. But in contrast to the Islamic governments, and the governments that surround it, why are you picking on them for? They have the best human rights record. Had a member of the British cabinet last week forced to resign, fired. Because she wanted aid to go to the Israeli government to help Syrian refugees that were being ignored by the Arab governments. <laughs> People fleeing in desperate need of medical treatment <coughs> across the barbed wire into the Golan Heights to try to get into an Israeli hospital, bringing wounded children and all sorts of. And she did and she, and they didn't want to fire her. They said it was not approved by the Prime Minister. Now again, I'm not here to politically editorialize, but I make no secret of the view that when this country, by the grace of God, voted Brexit, mm -hmm. you should have automatically had a Brexit Prime Minister, mm -hmm. not somebody who that wasn't. Was yeah. And who was prompted by Obama to say that Israel has no historical claim to the Wailing Wall or the Kotel, the Temple Mount. That's how she voted. 
more than two weeks later, she nearly lost the election. The Northern Irish saved her neck. Almost cost Corbyn to become Prime Minister. Why is that woman the Prime Minister? Nations get the leaders they deserve. We're going to see this thing with Israel becoming an issue among people claiming to be Well, let's look again at what Paul goes on to say in Timothy. and John Ritz, he continues about what happened to him and he relates his personal experiences. Okay. Verse 12, and indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Just think of that Christian couple who ran the guest house being astronomically fined and forced to pay damages. And the west of Canada, a Canadian clergyman was fined 15,000 Canadian dollars several years ago for a reading from Romans chapter 1. They accused of a hate crime. This is only the beginning. These other people all were going forth, they're taking the kingdom up. Oh, my Lord. Evil men and imposters, in verse 13, will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Remember, these false teachers who deceive people are deceived themselves. You, however, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. He's talking about Timothy's childhood experience growing up in a believing family learning the scriptures as a kid to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus in verse 15. Now look at verse 16. All scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, <coughs> reproof for correction, for training in righteousness. A number of years ago in Leeds, England, when our ministry was based in Leeds, I had an array pastor from the Baptist Church come in and he objected to my objecting to the fact that they had a transvestite in his church who come to church dressed as a woman in an evangelical church, baking the bread for the Lord's Supper and in charge of the communion ministry. And I showed him this was wrong, and he said, Oh, but that's the Old Testament. And I said, No. Romans 1 is not the Old Testament. Here, look what it says in Revelation. It's not the good answer. He had a pick and choose approach to doctrinal theology. He was going to a cafeteria. I'll have this, none of that, thank you. Just takes the bits he likes, omits the bits he doesn't. I've even had pastors who agree with what people like me say or what you would have heard Chris or Ian or Sheldon share. But will say, they will say, don't preach about it. They just prefer to ignore it. This is something that's going to divide the true church from the false church. All scripture now that includes the Old Testament, which is more than two-thirds of Scripture. That is the only Bible, the only Scripture the first Christians had. There is nothing in the New Testament, nothing, that is not in the Old Testament. Nothing. Well, let's go further. And the New Testament, it quotes the Old extensively. Look what Paul said. 
Turn with me, please, if you will, to the book of Acts. It is farewell address to the church in Ephesus. Acts chapter 20. Verse 20, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. Verses 26 and 27 of this farewell discourse to the church. And it says, Therefore I testify to you this day I'm innocent of the blood of all men. I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. The faithful church will eat everything the Lord puts on the plate. That God says you need to eat this. The faithful church will eat it all. The unfaithful church will prefer a cafeteria. A pick and choose approach to the word of God. Now I've seen this expressed in all kinds of ways. I think many of us have had encounters with organizations that claim to love Israel and the Jews in some way. But they have published and published non-evangelistic policies. Now I do not say that everybody has to evangelize the Jews in the way that I would. There's a lot to be said for, in Israel particularly, for expatriates to build personal relationships and share within that. <coughs> but when you get into people saying we don't have to evangelize at all, or it's not our ministry, or not our calling, or even worse, dual covenant theology. <coughs> even if they don't use the term like John Hagee. They're just taking some. <coughs> My wife here, she's in. My wife is the daughter of Holocaust survivors. Jewish Holocaust survivors. Their parents were almost killed. The rest of the family, Mandy was killed. And my wife will tell you, I'm not speaking for her, you can ask her yourself, she'll tell you, that it was a tragedy that her grandfather was dragged out to the village square by the populists and the Nazis and machine gun. And she will tell you it is a bigger tragedy that this was done in the name of Jesus Christ. But my wife will tell you that the biggest tragedy of all was that her grandfather did not know Jesus Christ as his Messiah when they pulled the trigger as far as she is aware. How many Jewish believers we have here today? We've got about a half dozen with us. I only speak for me, I don't speak for them. You ask a Jewish person the biggest need of the Jewish people. Now the Jewish believers love and appreciate Christians who are supportive of Israel and who oppose anti-Semitism? Absolutely! But to withhold the gospel from a Jew? That's anti-Semitism in itself! You see, people establish some artificial criteria of what makes somebody kosher and acceptable, spiritually or doctrinally. Some people will say, as long as you believe in God's purpose for Israel. I know people, I've met people, 
they will determine someone's orthodoxy not on what they believe so much, but on what version of the Bible they read. That if you don't read the King James, they think there's something wrong with you spiritually. Even though they can't read the original languages themselves. <laughs> ignorance upon ignorance. Now, I have nothing against the King James Bible, by the way. Nothing at all. But the priority, according to Nehemiah 8, chapter 8, is the original meaning of the original languages. They make an artificial standard or criteria to establish and determine orthodoxy or acceptability. Peter Ruffin was on his third marriage. The fact that the guy lived immorally didn't matter to them. He read the King James, he was all right. There are people who believe that Jews can be saved under the law, even though the law has not been even observable since 70 AD. But that's all right. They believe in God's perfect. They must be all right. Most of us have encountered people who think somebody is acceptable and they're kosher and they're right with the Lord and so on if they speak or pray in tongues. In many cases, it's not even real tongues. It's gibberish. <laughs> But that's okay as long as the tongues there. <coughs> Remember that clowning in tongues video with Rodney Brown and Kevin Copeland? Yeah. Rodney Brown said, don't try to understand it. How many of you pray in tongues? That was supposed to be the proof of the pudding that it was from God. Smart. They get some other standard other than scripture. Or it becomes a pick and choose approach. I didn't shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Now, I believe in the gift of tongues. I think it still operates in the church. That's not to say I believe that much of or most of what we hear is authentic, but I do not deny what's in Scripture. I believe cessationism is a false doctrine. Finally, I believe cessationism is a false doctrine. And I believe certainly in the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. I believe in a lot of things. But you cannot base orthodoxy on any one thing. It has got to be the entire countenance of God. All scripture. Not a selective approach to it. That'll be the third thing that will separate the true church from the Harvard Church. <laughs> A selective approach to a big one. <coughs> it's always been around since the time of the church fathers. But it is eclipsed <coughs> by periods of normalcy only to come back again and reaches apexes at certain times in church history including our own time. But it's going to get worse. I speak of a claimed extra scriptural doctrinal revelation 
and praxis. They will believe and do things that have no scriptural basis that can be arrived at from rightly dividing the word of God as a judgment. I uh, will not mention the lady's name or the sister I know who's with us left the church recently. So happens in Eden Church. And she went to the elders respectfully with her concerns, <laughs> showing them from Scripture what was wrong with some of the things they were doing. One of which was, quote unquote, soaking. <laughs> they literally lay on the floor and think they can soak up the Holy Spirit. By hanging around on the floor, they have these soaking meetings and soaking. When she challenged this, she was told, that she was the one who was believing things that were heretical. Now understand what heresy means in Greek. It's a false doctrine that brings a schism. That's what the word means, heresis. It comes from the Greek word irun, to take one thing out. And she told them, look, the Holy Spirit is never prayed to in Scripture except in the context of the Trinity. And they got really angry about this and told her she was a heretic. <laughs> but they couldn't give her one Scripture. Not one. Should be the easiest people to win an argument with. Show us from Scripture by rightly dividing the Word of God, and you automatically win hands down. Now understand what happens. What you see happening in the church today is what you see happening in the secular media. It's called the narrative. The narrative. In popular culture, it's called the narrative. I'll give you examples of the narrative. I'm not politically editorializing. It was pointed out, Hillary Clinton said, isn't it about time we had a woman president? Well, if it was an American Margaret Thatcher, I'd vote for it tomorrow. I'd campaign for it. I'd send a contribution. That's my personal view, you may differ. I wouldn't mind a woman president when she was an American Margaret Thatcher. But God forbid we had a Hillary Clinton. When you point out the issues about her and the lies and the corruption and the scandals, the narrative says, you're part of the war on women. You're a misogynist. <coughs> they wouldn't deal with the issues. They just followed the narrative. <coughs> there were a number of black Americans who pointed out that the policies of Barack Obama had done nothing to help black Americans economically. And that black Americans were largely worse off under Barack Obama than they had been. They simply pointed this out. This was the world's leading, the world's leading pediatric brain surgeon, Dr. Ben Carson, the only surgeon in the world to successfully separate encephalophagocytes twins joined at the brain. He's the only surgeon who ever did it within the baby's life. Brilliant man. Or the economist, Professor Walter Williams, or the economist, Dr. Thomas Sowell. These are very highly, Highly intelligent people, <laughs> highly intelligent people, extremely intelligent people. And they were hated by the left-wing media, 
not for what they were saying, but because they were black and said Obama was just part of the thing. Obama bailed out the banks, he did nothing for the people. And they began saying that you're an Uncle Tom and all that. <laughs> they hate, they follow the narrative. If you said Obama is to no good and he did everything he did is messed up. You're a racist, you're a racist. They just follow the narrative. <coughs> if you believe <coughs> that homosexuality should not be taught as part of the curriculum in schools funded by the taxpayer, and there should be parental options or opt out, you're a homophobe, you're a homophobe. That is the narrative. <laughs> <laughs> they follow a narrative. They won't deal with the issues. They follow a narrative. Now when the world is like that, that's the world. People get manipulated by cliches. That's the world. But when the church does it, we have some people here who I first met a number of years ago. They heard about me somehow and called me up. They were in a church where two weeks in a row the pastor's wife put a carpet on the floor of the church. And it was something like, you must be like children to come to Jesus. So these women got down on this carpet in the church and became incontinent. There were such hysterics and things like this, they lost bladder control. And when other women said they wouldn't do it, they were told they were grieving the Holy Spirit. They <laughs> were suppressing the Holy Spirit. And she asked me, what do you think I should do? <laughs> And I said, you have two options. Find another church. So what's the second option? Put a nappy in the collection. <laughs> it's ludicrous. It, 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 it's beyond absurd. It's like a Kafka movie. You couldn't make it up. That's not the world. It's the church. And it always comes down to this. They claim some extra biblical revelation for their doctrine and practice. That's what they claim. And if you don't go along with it, you're not hearing from the Lord. You're suppressing the Holy Spirit. <laughs> You're a heretic. Crazy. Now just look at those four things. Return of the Jews. The prophetic of the, the return of Jesus in the church. The prophetic destiny of Israel and the Jews. Selective approach to doctrine. And of what's in scripture. And then a plain extra biblical doctrinal basis. And what's not in scripture. Well, let's look at the fifth one. <coughs> Jesus prayed. He prefaces his high priestly prayer. Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. I am the truth. It's all about truth. The unity of the Spirit depends upon truth. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. He is not the Spirit of error. Jesus said you will lead into the whole truth. We cannot have the unity of the Spirit but there's an absence of truth.
they will seek to have a unity. Not based on the truth of God's word. <coughs> he dies once and for all, perfecting those who have been saved. If it's perfect, you can't improve upon it by definition. We don't need a priest to sacrifice this time and time again, we're told in Hebrews. Jesus did this once and for all. Oh no, he continues to die again sacramentally in the Mass. Remember, Sheldon can explain it to you better than I can. The doctrine of the Mass is a fundamental rejection of the Gospel of Calvary. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> oh, I know wonderful Catholic believers. Nobody says otherwise, but they'll stop being Catholic if they're real believers. The Holy Spirit's going to show them this doesn't add up. I know plenty of people who left the Catholic Church after they got saved. They just read the scripture and the Holy Spirit showed them this does not add up. Oh, we have to be one. You can only be one with people who believe the truth. Now most movements and denominations begin based on truth. Most of them begin based on truth. Or have begun based on the truth. <coughs> they have the unity of the spirit. One faith, one baptism. When you have the unity of the Spirit, all you need is a fellowship of fellowships to do things like fund mission programs or build a seminary or something like that. All you need is a fellowship of fellowships. You don't need a centralized organization with a hierarchy. As you may have heard me say before, once a movement begins to fragment doctrinally, it is fragmenting spiritually. And what they do is compensate for the lack of spiritual unity, the lack of doctrinal unity, by getting into an organizational, institutional, legal, and financial unity. Again, based on things like property trusts and so forth, and pension funds and things like that. That's what they do. They attempt to develop another kind of unity. What the Catholic Church says is, look how many kinds of Protestants there are. We are one church. <laughs> well, yeah, they're one institution. They're one behemoth of, of, of corruption. But they don't all believe the same things. I know Catholic priests have told people, you can practice birth control. Even though the church says it's a sin. They don't believe the same things. You've got traditional Catholics very aggravated at the present Pope. You've got all kinds of stuff. The Catholic Church has never been united except as a political and financial force, as a theocratic force, but never as a spiritual force, never. Never. They have a different definition of unity. Unity is not based on truth. They don't even believe their own catechism. Uh, I can show you in a catechism that's imprimatur and has an island outside that says it's necessary to be a member of the Roman Catholic Church to have salvation. And at the same time, I can show you papal encyclicals calling other Christians separated brethren, saying they can have salvation, and even Buddhists and Muslims. They contradict themselves. They're not united doctrinally. It's all lies. It's all PR. 
Now it's a political monolith, <laughs> but that's all. It's financially integrated, but that's all. They have a unity not based on truth. But now it's gone beyond ecuidism. It's gone into things like Chrislam. It's gone into evangelical churches that have yoga classes. Talk to a brother or sister saved out of Hinduism. Talk to them. They'll tell you what yoga really is. It's demonic. They don't be yoked to the yogi. Instead of the Christ by the Holy Spirit. The whole idea of emptying yourself, that passivity, that just opens you to demonic influence. A unity not based on truth. The faithful church will have a unity based on truth. The harlot church will have a unity based on political correctness. That's what it's going to be like. That is the fifth thing that is going to separate, and that is already separating the faithful church from the harlot. The sixth thing. <clears throat> An accommodation of immorality. masters of religious double talk. They will be masters of manipulative semantics. Now let's understand this. What differentiated Jesus from the Sanhedrin and the other rabbis of his day. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, please. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. The result was that when Yeshua had fit, Jesus had finished these words, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching. What amazed them? He was teaching them as one having authority, not as their scribes. Jesus always interpreted the letter of the law and light of the spirit. He didn't try to accommodate things. Just look at it. Never in the name of love or of tolerance did he ever fail to call something other than what it was when it was sick or when it was false. Many of you heard me say these things. The Syrophoenician woman. He made a statement that if understood out of context would sound bigoted or racist. She comes desperate to him, please help my little girl, demon possessed. Jesus loved that little Syrophoenician girl as much as he would have loved the little Jewish girl. But he told her mother, 
I cannot give the children's bread to the dogs. Now the Greek is diminutive, it's sort of being puppies, almost term of affection. He called him a dog! Dogs were a Jewish idiom for pagans, not on the basis of race, but of false belief. You remember Psalm 22? Dogs surround me. Talk about the Romans. Dogs. Wow. Well, dogs can respond to human relationships better than most other animals, can they? <laughs> dogs can even respond to human relationships better than more intelligent animals like porpoises and chimpanzees. There is no species that I am aware of that can interact with humans and cooperate with humans more than dogs. Certain species of dogs are more intelligent than others. French poodles are quite intelligent, but really intelligent dogs, sometimes Alsatians, but golden retrievers and Labrador retrievers. They make the best seeing eye dogs. They have the highest success rate of training seeing eye dogs with the golden retrievers and Labrador retrievers. Monkeys cannot be trained to do what those dogs can do. Okay, these dogs are the most interactionable with humans. Okay. They can do all kinds, they can rescue people, they can find people with after it's a, an avalanche or after a building collapses or something like this, they can be trained to do all kinds of bloodhounds to find missing lost children. They can do all kinds of things. They can be good for stuff. They are even colloquially called man's best friend. <coughs> you can get some amazing dogs. Dogs that can do all kinds of tricks. Dogs that are very intelligent. Dogs that love their masters. Dogs that are fantastic. But there's still a dog. <laughs> At the end of the day, there's still a dog. So she comes, oh, help my little girl. I can't give the children's bread to dogs. Before Jesus could help the little Gentile girl, he made her mother deal with the fact that she was a pagan, that her belief system was false and what she believed was unfit for human consumption. It was dog food. Any kind of teaching of a religious nature, any kind of doctrine that is incompatible with scripture is dog food. It's not fit for human consumption. What Jesus was saying to her is, you want me to help your little girl stop eating dog food? You're a human being made in the image and likeness of God. Stop behaving like a dog. Strong words! That offended her race and her culture. Or the Samaritan woman. You Jews have this mountain, we have that mountain. Before he goes any further in the conversation, Lady, you don't know what you're talking about. Salvation comes from the Jews. Amen. Where did he ever compromise on doctrine so as not to offend somebody's cultural or ethnic sensitivities? He never did. Did he love the Syrophoenician woman? Yes. Did he love her little girl? Yes. Did he love the Samaritan woman? Yeah, he was more open with her about himself than he was with his own apostles, than he was with the other with the Jews. But never in the name of love or tolerance did he ever accommodate wrong belief. Nor wrong practice. Don't get your husband. I don't have a husband. You're right, you have to find him. <laughs> he didn't fool around. Now people will say, let he without sin cast the first stone. 
That is true. But Jesus didn't say she didn't sin. He told the paralytic, the woman of Bethesda, go your way and sin no more. If the word of God says something is wrong, that's not you judging and it's not me judging. <laughs> Moreover, we are commanded to be a crino, to investigate if something is scriptural or not. What will separate the true church from the harlot church? They will accommodate immorality and false doctrine. Except in very, very narrow circumstances. <coughs> Divorce and remarriage is adultery. Hear what I said? Well, it's not what I say. What I say doesn't matter. Except in very, very narrow circumstances. <coughs> Divorce and remarriage is adultery. It should be unheard of for two believers to get divorced and remarried. Unheard of! Even in a bad marriage and a bad relationship, the last resort of last resorts is separation with the door open for the hope and possibility of future reconciliation according to 1 Corinthians 7. The idea of two saved believers getting divorced and remarried having children out of wedlock in the eyes of Christ. You understand that? <clears throat> and then they take the Lord's Supper and eat and drink judgment for themselves, defiling his table. But there are churches accommodating people. They've got preachers, pastors, who are divorced and remarried for no scriptural grounds. And the scriptural grounds are very few and very far between. Once they compromise on doctrine, sort of related to what Ian was saying, once they compromise on doctrine, it is inevitable they will compromise on holiness, on the moral standards of God. It's inevitable. Jesus is coming for is that the bride that Jesus is coming for will have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. They will be hitabrut in Hebrew, brit cemented together. Shutafut in Hebrew. Where they will be koinonia in Greek. An extended family, people who are committed to each other because they're committed to Christ. The Harlot Church will have the form of religion. If there is a mega church, my first question, and they're collapsing anyway, my first question is. Gee, how many people in your mega church? 10,000? And this church is in America, there's not like that. So I've spoken again. Gee, 10,000. 
That means you should have about 900 home groups. <laughs> You're not going to have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. You can hide in a church of 10,000 people. You can live the way you want to. There'll be no accountability to other believers. Nobody's going to see. Nobody's going to question. Nobody's going to know anything. You're not going to have to do anything. Just show up. Maybe pay a tithe or something like that. They'll do that and continue living the way they want to. Look with me, please, to the Hebrew prophet Amos. <coughs> Chapter 4, verse 4. Enter Bethel, house of God, and people. Thank you. <laughs> Enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithe every three days. Offer a thank offering from that which is leavened. <laughs> and proclaim free will offerings, make them known. For so you love to do, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord. If you want to see a religious spectacle, you can go on Yom Kippur to a Orthodox synagogue. They go there. The women are upstairs in the balcony, chatting away. <coughs> the men are downstairs, mimicking the cantor, And they go there, and I'm telling you, I've seen this. They go there so everybody will see that they're there, that they're members of the community. And they say, who's showing up? I'm here. That's it. It's about identification with the community. And they put up on like this board or in a program who gave the most money to the most Jewish charities. <laughs> so everybody will know. What a good Jew you are. <coughs> That's how they think. Now, these are unsaved people who reject their own Messiah, who are blinded by religion. Is the church any different? Um, I've seen churches in Australia. This is one church in Australia that's got crinkled. It's unbelievable. Bill Pringle. He ran his church on an Amway. The, you know, the marketing, the marketing skill all night. And that's what took the thing over. The, the pyramid schemes. He was running the pyramid scheme with a cross on the top of it. They will have the form. The Harlot Church will have the form. But it will not have the power. Back. If they did, they'd be living differently. <coughs> you need fellowship to have the power. Ian spoke earlier. He didn't give the Hebrew word so idle. Kikuch. <laughs> Iron sharpens iron, thus a man strengthens his friend's countenance. <coughs> uh, it, was, it, was, it was Chris, it was Chris, sorry, it was Chris. <coughs> they won't be the wrong way. And that's exactly what God has you in the same house group. <laughs> Now there's one kind of hikuch that God ordained that really deals with our old nature. It's called holy matrimony, but let's not go there. Does everybody understand 
187 points. These seven characteristics are going to be the characteristics of the harlot church that will wind up in Revelation 17 and 18. The footstool of the Antichrist. They'll go into the world's false religious. Or, conversely, the counterparts will be the seven characteristics of the faithful bride of Christ. Words both ways. Now we've talked enough, more than I really wanted to, about what's wrong. We know. And sometimes you just have to. People need to be updated about this garbage. But what we need to be concentrating on is not what the Harlot Church is and is going to be. What we need to concentrate on is what the faithful bride Amen. is going to be. Adorn her, her husband. Amen. It's going to be the diametric opposite. <coughs> the faithful bride will be looking for the epiphany is appearing the return of Jesus. The blessed hope. Blessed hope is not the rapture, it goes beyond the rapture. The faithful God will understand the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. The faithful bride will take on board the entire counsel of God. The faithful bride will base its doctrine, its beliefs, and its practices on what is in Scripture and on nothing other. The faithful bride will have the genuine unity of the Spirit who is the spirit of truth. The faithful bride will not accommodate things that the word of God says are morally wrong. The faithful bride will not have a religion. <coughs> it won't be a religion. The faithful bride will be a fellowship. Thank you so much. I'm